uh, does anybody like Hillary or Trump or they're just against the other one? Let's not be against everything. I'm against Trump. I'm against Hillary. Like somebody before something, please. And uh, yeah. And let's be for peace. Can we pretend it's the 60s again and stop blowing each other up? So that was uh, Jackie DeShannon. Uh, put a little love in your heart. And I say put a lot of love in your heart. And uh, crack producer Julie Canfer, who's away this week, being substituted for uh, by my uh, dear friend Paula, who I absolutely love, Paula Bautista. I probably pronounced that wrong. Very good at uh, doing that. Uh, but I uh, love friggin' Paulo also. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, Julie uh, is running this thing like the Today Show or something. I mean, we have one breaking story after another. Everything that we're giving you uh, today hasn't even been uh, truly published yet. This uh, story that we just shared from Israel is in uh, JAMA Internal Medicine online. And now we have our man who is able to predict the future, our first ever fortune teller here on Heart to Heart. And it's Dr. Ramsey Camus, who is clinical research fellow and consultant cardiologist at the Hammersmith Hospital campus of the Imperial College in London. And this is a very, very, very uh, famous uh, institution. He's actually a PhD and a number of other things, which I don't even know what they are, and maybe he can clarify it. Uh, MBCHB and a DIC. Very interesting, but most interesting to us, a lead author of a recent study suggesting a blood test may someday be able to determine heart attack risk. Boy, I'm not even sure if I want that uh, blood test. Dr. Camus. Uh, Fred Fight, Hello. interventional cardiologist here in New York. Thank you so, so very much for coming on with us this morning. How are you? Oh, that's great. Thanks a lot, Fred. It's always nice to talk to a fellow interventionist wherever you are in the world. And uh, it's a, a real honor for me to be hosted by you. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, no, the honor is mine. So part of this, so you are also an interventional cardiologist. Yeah, well, that's right. I... Um, uh, primarily, my clinical training is in interventional cardiology, and I did most of my training here at Imperial. And I then I caught the bug of research, uh, having joined uh, the lab of um, a very eminent professor here at Imperial, Professor Dorian Haskard, who's been in the field for uh, many years. And uh, I kind of turned up not knowing what an immunoglobulin is, and he taught me immunology over the years. Wow. We kind of still working together. And tell me, just uh, so I, we can be better at Scrabble and crossword puzzles someday, what is the MBCHB situation? That's just an equivalent to the American MD, so that's just the Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery. Oh, that, the uh, position. All right, that would yeah, have been helpful for me to know that. Now, I want to tell you that what uh, what Ramsey is doing is almost impossible. When you start out as a as a clinical interventional cardiologist you know you're responsible for these patients and sometimes they get uh, they're very sick when they come in and you have to attend to them sometimes it takes them a while to get better sometimes there are complications you have to be very devoted to that you have to be on call and then uh, so many of us say well you know we want to be an academic interventional cardiologist and do some research also and that's you know, you can pull that off. You sometimes, I mean, I got lucky. I met Peter Rentrop, and we did some early uh, clot buster stuff for heart attacks and things like that. And you can get involved in clinical trials. But when you start getting involved a little bit here in science, and as Dr. Cam has said, you know, he started out, and he's being a little modest, uh, not knowing what an antibody is, and, and then becoming a true expert in this whole uh field of immunoglobulins, uh, it's really, that's a hard path, Ramsey Camus, and I really want to tip my hat to you. So, oh, that's, uh, that's great. Thank you very much. I think um, really partly it's um, uh, a path that some people in the UK do as part of their training. You kind of step aside and do a PhD for a few years, and then if you kind of enjoy it and do well there are, there is some provision that you can kind of you know marry up the clinical career to research but it's also very difficult and 
it's not getting easier. It's getting more and more difficult with the pressures on the National Health Service here. And, you know, there's a lot of pressures getting funding for research as well. So, yeah, I mean, it's tough, but it's uh, worth doing and it's a lot of fun. Oh, my God. And now Brexit, I should say, oh, my goodness. But uh, Brexit, now the pound is uh, if you're buying uh, your pipettes from... <laughs> <laughs> from an American company, you're suddenly going to get fewer pipettes. But uh, we, what do you think about Brexit? Should I ask how you well, voted? I mean, the, uh, the university line, our you know, Imperial College line on it is very clear. We're a European university and we remain to be a European university. A lot of our students and staff and really brilliant people are from Europe and we all feel European here and um, we hope to carry on feeling like that, and really, I, I, we just hope that doesn't affect our uh, funding, and um, we just hope it won't affect the um, really high-caliber people that we attract to the UK and the really nice atmosphere that we have here. We're welcome and um, feels part of a big family, big European family, and let's just hope that things work out for the better, and it's just a thing that doesn't really affect the way we work. And that's one thing about uh, cardiology in general, the international, and uh, I guess, uh, you know, other than uh, having evolved from uh, being part of Britain uh, here in the United States, the international collaborations are just absolutely spectacular. Inter and, and not just Europe plus Britain, anywhere plus anywhere. I've never seen a field, and especially interventional cardiology, uh, where the same individuals are meeting in uh, Hong Kong and uh, Hawaii and Japan and England and all over Europe and Moscow and just everywhere. I mean, if the uh, countries got as long as, as well as all the interventional cardiologists, uh, it would be spectacular. And by the way, uh, we only have Dr. Camus till the top of the hour, and I don't know if he has consultation fees when he's there, but uh, unknowingly he has waived all his consultation fees today. So if you call one eight seven seven six nine eight three six two seven here at Sirius XM 110 Dr. Radio, you will get a uh, consultation from Dr. Camus. So uh, ASCOT was a, a big trial. You can remind us what the trial was about, but uh, as part of this uh, large captive population, you were then able to do your analysis about these immunoglobulins, and uh, why don't you explain it to us rather than me trying to? Well, yeah, sure. Well, thanks a lot, um, Fred. So, yes, ASCOT uh, really is um, uh, one of the um, uh, very important studies that were conducted to test two different blood pressure treatments to start with. It's the anglo scandinavian Cardiac Outcomes Trial, and um, we, it, it had over around 20,000 patients, but from the UK and Ireland, we it randomized uh, 9,098 patients. Um, and the rule for being included in ASP is that you had to have high blood pressure plus three other risk factors for uh, cardiovascular disease. So the population that were recruited into ASPOS were um, the high-risk population, so people who are more likely to have events. And um, it ended up having two arms, so blood pressure lowering arm and a statin arm, where, where patients at high risk were given a total statin 10 milligrams of placebo. But... Um, as it turns out, the real value for us of the trial was that uh, it was so well conducted that the patients were really uh, well looked at, well characterized, and they were followed up for five and a half years. And there was um, uh, blood and serum saved at the baseline recruitment time. And so what we were able to do is design what's called a nested case control study where you uh, get the patients that had events and then you match them with controls in two to one fashion so that you have a matched population in terms of age and sex and um, then you do different measurements to see whether there's a difference between the cases and the controls and uh, what we set out to do in this nested case control study was to see whether um, serum immunoglobulins in particular immunoglobulin G and M uh, predicted um, events or freedom of events in terms of cardiovascular events in this hypertensive 
population. And at the same time, we also tested specific antibodies against um, uh, dangerous um, uh, lipid, which is oxidized LDL. Um, and these antibodies were tested in the past for um, their protective or kind of dangerous uh, associations. And the, the, the um, publications were murky and they were quite conflicted. So we wanted to see whether we can clarify this in our population. Beautiful. So, so uh, this is one of the great things about uh, randomized trials. And we did have Dr. Leibowitz talking about uh, another parallel advance is if you have really good electronic medical records and you have a captive population that stays within uh, one specific healthcare system and gets all their follow-up that way, uh, that's a great way to study patients. But there's nothing uh, like a randomized trial because patients get regular, intense follow-up, uh, not at the uh, whim or practice, however appropriate of a given physician, but everything is kind of regimented. You know, every yeah. three months you get this, and every six months you get this, and you get this blood test, and you get that blood test. So you could take a real look, and obviously the purpose of the uh, ASCOT study, as uh, Ramsey has pointed out, was uh, not to evaluate this, but it is a captive population where we can then evaluate whether these uh, antibodies are predictive of anything, and this is... Uh, a journal called eBiomedicine, and uh, Julie, uh, on her hot streak, the other one, of course, hasn't been published in print yet. This thing, uh, only the good Lord knows, is labeled article in press. So this is some kind of super spectacular uh, breaking news here on Heart to Heart. So what did we find? Are antibodies good? Are they bad? Is, there, is it a specific antibody? How predictive of yeah. is it? If, if you tell me I'm minus too low or too high, am I supposed to go write my will? Or if, if it's the right thing, am I, am I going to have uh, all I have to do for the rest of my life is get cancer screening because, and not fall down because I have achieved cardiovascular immortality? Uh, how powerful are the findings and what the heck are they? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, we, you know, it's really important not to overstate the findings. I mean, it's um, they were surprising because we did find that total serum IgG, which is the most um, common immunoglobulin that you have in your blood, which is kind of, you know, really um, kind of, you know, I, I liken it to uh, just kind of the policeman in the blood where it goes around and finds bad things and then presents them to different cells that kind of, you know, deal with the, with the bad things, antigens, and, and traffic them away and hopefully get rid of them. And, you know, the kind of, you know, immunoglobulins, immunoglobulin G is what kind of deals with different bacteria and viruses, for example. But what was really interesting is that it wasn't just the immunoglobulins that were specific to the bad cholesterol, to the oxidized LDL that were that showed protection. It was this total level of IgG that had a really um, quite a dramatic effect on um, uh, risk stratification. So if you were in the highest level within, and I have to emphasize this is kind of within a normal range of levels. So if you have a very high serum IgG, you might have an illness and you know, that needs to be dealt with. Like you get really, really high serum IgGs in myeloma or autoimmune disease. But this is within the kind of normal levels in healthy individuals. If you're in the highest tertiary, so if you're in the highest third of, of these readings, then um, these patients had um, a protective uh, picture. So uh, they were protected from cardiovascular disease, and it includes both um, coronary uh, artery disease and stroke, um, uh, down to a hazard ratio of uh, 0.62, so that's a 38% reduction in risk, and that's relative risk, of course. So that's so and interesting. So it's not only IgG uh, against bad cholesterol, but IgG levels in general. If, you have, if you're in the upper third within the normal range, uh, you're 38% less likely to have a cardiovascular event. And now, uh, yeah. Ramsey, you have to tell me why. 
Does this mean that, uh, you know, the, like one very popular thing to say in this country is, hey, uh, you know, I, I, my immunity is down. I have low immunity. You know, it's like it, it's like saying you almost you came from a dysfunctional family. So it, it, what does it mean to be in the upper third? Does that mean when, we have um, we're protected against events yeah, somehow? Well, I mean, the other... Yeah, so the other finding that was interesting and that might kind of direct us towards the mechanism is that the protection against stroke, if you just tested against stroke and it's on its own, it wasn't there. Uh, it was mainly there for coronary um, artery events, so that's people having heart attacks or people uh, needing to have um, uh, revascularization, so either an angioplasty or surgery for um, uh, coronary artery disease or death from a heart attack. And so the relationship was even stronger for that. So for that, um, the risk reduction was more than 50%. So why? Relation from tell me, tell me, so tell me why. You said it helps we, you with the mechanism. Yeah, we haven't tested mechanism, and I have to emphasize this. The me- mechanism is still yet unknown. We can hypothesize, and we can have theories about what the mechanism is. Hypothesize away. Um, <laughs> so uh, we... Immunoglobulins, as such, are um, uh, there to, as I said, to clear up um, uh, all the all the crud. Um, and so, if you imagine, if you have, um, um, if they're like rubbish trucks, or you know, as maybe in America, trash trash trucks, um, where if you have a lot of bad stuff in the blood that might go and cause atherosclerosis like oxidized LDL, these antibodies, if you have a lot of them, they'll be more uh, able to clear up this crud and take it away, trash it away, probably to the liver and to the reticular and the system to get rid of it, uh, rather than uh, the stuff going to the arteries. What's really interesting is that um, the innate, uh, the, the humoral immune system, which includes antibodies, um, is known to be protected. IgG as such hasn't been shown in the past, but our lab, um, and I mentioned our work with uh, uh, Professor Dorian Hasker, who's a foundation professor here at the and he's been thinking about this for a lot longer than I have. And he did some experiments before I joined the lab where he got, um, where he stripped away genetically immunoglobulin away from experimental animals. And he showed beautifully that that uh, was uh, quite badly, and so that kind of was a start, uh, you know, to explain the mechanism that actually immunoglobulins. So how, how do, uh, who, who, so, so uh, Dr. Camus, who gets into the upper third? I mean, uh, obviously now I want to be in the upper third, and is there a way, yeah. did you look at, did you segment the population? Is it people who are younger, older, happier, have less comorbid yeah. conditions? I know this is going to be an independent uh, predictor, yeah. obviously, but uh, is there is there some common thread yeah. as to who tends sure. to have the higher levels? Sure. So uh, it is definitely an independent predictor. So it was completely independent of smoking, diabetes, uh, blood pressure, cholesterol, HDL, creatinine, uh, body index, family history of heart disease, um, statin treatment, as well as C and uh, anti-BROPMP. So there's no relationship with any of these things. But um, we had the relationship with uh, gender and weak relationships so women had higher levels than men for them. you know that there might be something in that but what we're doing at the moment is we have just started doing a genome-wide association study to see whether there is a genetic um, programming where you you know you may be born with uh, your B cells throwing off a lot more immunoglobulins and therefore you're protected so there might be genetic like, my theory and my hypothesis is that it may be a passive immunization effect from childhood. Um, a lot of um, things have a, a epitopes in common. What I mean by epitopes, these are the bits on antigens that are recognized by antibodies. And so what's really fascinating is, for example, pneumococcal bacteria has um, a lot in common with oxidized LDL in terms of how it gets recognized by 
anti-PC antibodies. And so the, it might be an early passive immunization. Beautiful. Effect, maybe. And believe it or maybe not, you, believe it or not, we're up against a hard break. It's uh, very uh, interesting, and we're going to see more uh, about this, obviously. So people are going to look in other studies and see if we can confirm this finding. Thank you. Uh, so much, Ramsey Camus. We're going to be back with Steve Marso. More breaking news on a uh, big study showing a survival benefit of a diabetes drug. Very excited about that. So, Fred Fight, Steve Marso, Sirius XM 110, 1877, NYU Docs, back after the break. This is interventional cardiologist, Dr. Fred Fight on Dr. Radio. 